Hey, what's going on, guys? I'm here with Andrew Levine, who is the CEO of Coinos Group. And uh, we're just going to be talking about Coinos in the video. So how's it going, Andrew? Thanks for uh, coming on. Yeah, it's going well. Thanks for thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess to start sort of, what's what's your crypto background and uh, and how did Coinos come about? What led to the development of this? Yeah, so I'll give you kind of from the beginning, from my beginning, because it all connects ultimately into Coinos. I actually, I, I don't have a coding background. I first fell in love with open source software actually in law school. And I basically learned two things from law school. I learned about open source software, which is software that doesn't belong to anybody. It literally belongs to the public and fell in love with that idea. And I learned how antiquated, inefficient, and unfair the legal system was. And also how ubiquitous the legal system is. People think about the political system, the financial system, and the legal system as these different systems, but they're all tied together by laws and documents and contracts that are like literal pieces of paper, you know, that people are always interpreting and are getting lost and are subject to interpretation. And so I graduated from law school, not wanting to practice law at all, um, <laughs> wanting to, because it was, it seemed insane to me um, mm -hmm. and really wanting to, to get involved in technology and with a, with a strong eye on open source software, which is still fairly nascent at the time. And uh, I was very passionate about economics, graduated from law school into the great financial crisis, like so many people going, what the hell is going on? What's wrong with our system? So when the Bitcoin white paper came out pretty soon after that, that was right on my radar because it was exactly it tied in exactly to everything that I was looking at at the time, open source software, what was wrong with the financial system? What do we need to fix it? And one of the things that always stood out to me about open source software and the problem with it was that it wasn't really sustainable because it wasn't monetizable, uh, right? If it's public software, how do you make money off of it? How do you sustain the development of this open source software? And so, one of my first projects, one of my first entrepreneurial endeavors was something called Giver Hub. It was a social network. It was an online portal for charitable giving. And the idea was to have a social component. And I realized, well, I need to incentivize people to participate in this, uh, in this network. Uh, the, the idea was you should be able to donate to any nonprofit in the U.S. in one click. Why are you going all over the place trying to find the places? You should be able to like look at all the information about the nonprofits. You should be able to see what's good about them. Um, but I realized I had an incentive problem, right? I'm trying to build this network, get everybody coming to one place. And there was a new cryptocurrency at the time. Right? Bitcoin was super inefficient. You didn't want to use it for anything like in an application. But there was a new crypto called Litecoin. Ah. Like, you know, so like what that, year are we right here? Oh, gosh, I am so terrible with years. It's got to be 2011, 2012. Okay. I think so that's, that's yeah. what that, so you were around. So did you pick up on Bitcoin like right when it got launched? Like were you aware soon. of it? All the yeah, pretty soon. Like I think 2009 is when I when I started. Uh, I remember uh, trying to mine it at nine dollars and thinking and joining a pool, a mining pool and mm -hmm. running my GPU 100 percent all night and mining like 0 0.00001 Bitcoin and thinking, and it was $9 on Mt. Gox, by the way. Um, yeah. And and realizing like, ah, you know, this is crazy. I just wasted all that electricity. It's $9 on this crazy shady exchange. It's yeah. gotta be overvalued. I'll just, I'll just get it when it's easier to get and when it's cheaper, you know? Um, yeah. So <laughs> So you're, you were in 2011 or so, Litecoin, you have this charity project. Yeah. And I realized that I have an incentive problem. So uh, I want to distribute rewards to people who participate. And so we forked Litecoin 
and we use it as a kind of reward system within the application. Now, the app didn't wind up going anywhere. Nonprofits don't like technology. They don't like adopting new things. Um, mm -hmm. But that was kind of where I first started bridging applications and blockchain technology. And this was before really, this was before Ethereum. This is before people were really thinking about blockchains as application development platforms. Uh, certainly mm -hmm. not something you would put inside of a social application. A few years later, uh, a project comes out called Steemit and the Steam blockchain. And so Steemit.com was a Reddit clone and the Steam blockchain was um, a social blockchain built for Steemit.com. And so you could see how that kind of ticked all of my boxes. And so I was immediately jumped all over that, started creating content on Steemit. And um, soon after, you kind of became like a, a little celebrity on that blockchain. Six, <laughs> six, <laughs> I guess, thanks. Um, but use that to work my way onto that team as kind of a community manager. My title was called uh, Community Liaison. I, I, that's what I suggested we call myself. Um, and I started part-time just to get in the door. And um, let's see, four years later, I was head of marketing and communications. I'd become great friends with the core blockchain developers of the team. Justin Sun took over the Steam blockchain that blockchain forked into the Hive blockchain and me and the core developers of the Steam blockchain decided to leave. We resigned and then we talked it over and decided to start a new blockchain called Coinos and start a company called, called Coinos Group. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the, the backstory of Coinos. There's a lot. There's a lot more we could get into there, but I sure. think the the one thing that I want to kind of circle back to is that when when Bitcoin came out, I was I was like, this is exactly what I've been looking for. What my takeaway from the Great Financial Crisis was that we needed a free market of currencies. Right. Everybody in America or like a lot of most people in America believe in some degree of a free market. Right. We, we, we believe that at the very least, the more free a market is, the more efficient it is and the more productive the people within it can become. But right. when it comes to currencies and when it comes to the financial system, we t we were taking it as a given that there should be a monopoly and we should only have one choice. And when they mess up, we just need to live with the consequences. And the funny thing is that now we're in a very different situation where back then the problem was, God, I even barely even remember the problem back then. I guess it was mortgage backed securities and all that stuff. Um, but sort now of we're, wasn't it, wasn't it maybe like the bank bailouts? It was the maybe something. Yeah, there there was a lot to. There were a lot of. There were there was quantitative easing. There was bank bailouts. There was too big to fail. There was bailing out the big automakers, um, and and some might have been good decisions, some bad. But ultimately, my takeaway was like, what's bad is not the decisions they're making. What's bad is that we have no choice. And, you know, yeah. fast forward to today, now we're dealing with the, the fallout of 0% interest rates for, te for, for God knows how long, right? And, like, this is not something we were able to opt out of, the, the inflation that's coming. And so, like, my, my – or the inflation that's here. But the, the, the thing that I want to highlight is that – so my, my big takeaway, and this is still somewhat of an – outlier stance within crypto is I was like this idea of a free market for currencies, you know, um, which kind of made no sense until Bitcoin came out. But when Bitcoin came out, I was like, see, 
see, we can have a free market for currencies because look, these, these people have figured out a way to create currencies because the big critique you would hear if you would suggest alternative currencies was you can't have a currency that isn't backed by a central bank. It's just not possible. So then Bitcoin comes out. And that's, again, my takeaway is, see, we can have a free market for currencies. But that was and continues to be a fairly outlier belief, right? Because people are like, no, 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 we don't want a free market for, for currencies. We want Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the best. Um, so that never really resonated with me. Um, and that's why Ethereum, when Ethereum came out, that was another mind blowing moment for me. Um, so I basically had three, well, four kind of mind blowing moments in crypto. The first being Bitcoin, the second being Ethereum. Um, and, and because again, and why it's because I'm like looking at this thing, I'm like, CC free, free market. This, this can be the free market because anybody can now create any kind of digital asset that they want. And then Steam was the big one. And this was, this was, this is my few real failures as a technologist, um, because I really believed it was the next big thing. Um, fee-less transactions, high-speed transactions, um, really bought into that vision, and, you know, spent four years of my life working on it. And, and in, in many ways, it was very great, especially for the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, but thinking like, okay, because you, you got to bear in mind, like I would have killed for Steam when I was building GiverHub. It was exactly what I needed. It was these social primitives. It was a fast and fearless digital currency. It was exactly what I needed. And I thought so many sites would use it. Now, there were a lot of underlying problems with the, the launch and the design of Steam, which we all learned working on Steam and scaling Steam and beating our head against these bricks in this mm -hmm. wall. And so when we left that project and we're all, we're all like best friends now because we just, you know, when you work in crypto, right. And you work on a project you love, like that's all you do, you so know? Kind of, yeah. 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 You know, so we left that and, you know, so I, I, I always ask myself, why am I CEO of this company? How, it, that seems like a very natural question for, for people to ask if, if they like understand what's going on, because my co-founders um, are blockchain architects. They're, they're serious blockchain engineers, incredibly talented engineers. They don't need me to build the blockchain. Um, but I think the answer to that is in the fallout of the Justin Sun takeover of the Steam blockchain, um, I was there talking to the guys being like, what are we going to do next guys? Come on. This is, we have an opportunity here. We've learned so much from our experience. We know what needs to be fixed. We know what's still needed in the space. Um, we saw how much value could be gotten out of a feeless blockchain in the steam blockchain. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the core thing, and sorry, sorry, I'm rambling, but you gave You're me good. permission before we, yeah. before we started. <laughs> You're fine. Um, you know, we developers loved Steam, even though it didn't have smart contracts. They loved it because it had feeless transactions. The thing they hated the most about it was that it didn't have smart contracts. Mm. So, so we knew that if we could bridge that gap and deliver a general purpose blockchain with smart contracts um, and maintain the feeless transactions, um, that would already be a huge help to a lot of the developers that we knew personally. And then we knew that all we had to do, well, there were just a couple of additional pieces that we needed to do that were very achievable to make it more than feeless, to make it free to use. And so that was kind of our launching point is, can we build a free to use blockchain? Um, and then as we were building, we kind of took on additional objectives. One being we never want a hard fork again because we've been through that 23 times. And that was just like personal, <laughs> like never like again. Really legitimately 23 times? Yeah, yeah. We we forked the Steam blockchain 23 times. Oh, wow. Okay. So, you know, like like these kind of Ethereum hard fork type things where you like Michael do Jordan. this. What's that? Michael Jordan. 
Oh yeah, hey, yeah, exactly. Magic it. number. I don't know. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then the last major thing was preventing the exchange attack, um, which is how Justin Sun was able to take control of the Steam blockchain. We obviously didn't want to start a blockchain, and th that was vulnerable to the exact same attack vector that right. our previous blockchain was. So, okay. So it's open source. Free to, which is big for me too. I really like the open source. It's okay. free to use, like the gas, the mana, all, all that there. Uh, it's got smart contracts now, which Steam did not have. So you guys have improved there. So is the, it sounds like, is there anything missing from that? Or is there a, a bigger feature that we haven't like touched on? Missing from that. Well, so so just to be clear, like thinking about Coinos and Steam in any kind of relation no longer like even right, makes right. any sense. There's no there's no shared code base, and it's a totally different animal. Um, and there's the Hive blockchain, and they're doing stuff, and that's cool. It's an application specific social blockchain. People should check it out. Coinos is a pure. We built it from the ground up. It's a general purpose blockchain. It's it it's. Um, and uh, the proof of burn consensus algorithm algorithm is interesting. So that's one thing you didn't mention. Um, that's how we prevent the exchange attack. It's got some other nice features to it. It's got deflationary and inflationary economics. But you hit the big ticket items. It's it, it's actually really just two are the like core pillars. Um, it's free to use and the most upgradable blockchain in the world. So those, okay. those are really the two things you can kind of build your understanding of Coinos on. It's, it's free to use. We, we want applica decentralized applications that can go viral. That's really right. Cause that's how we achieve mainstream adoption of blockchain technology. We think then yeah. on that journey, you find that you did things, you did a lot of things wrong that you need to fix and make better. That's where upgradability comes into play. So like, yeah, the proof of burn consensus algorithm is cool, but what's even cooler is that we can drop in, replace the consensus algorithm with a new consensus algorithm without a hard fork. And so this is what, it's kind this of a, a funny thing, with, right? What's that? This is what, I mean, that's great. I mean, isn't this what Ethereum is struggling with? Yes. With a lot of, a lot of their issues is that they have to do significant if they want any changes to happen, they can't just, it's not modular like that. They would have to do some sort of major fork that also has to be backward compatible to my understanding. Right? Or no? Yeah, yeah. Um, we don't, I don't want to get stuck on ETH. I just wanted yeah, sure. to say that, uh, yeah, so you're, a benefit there you know, for you guys is that you can do upgrades and it doesn't require much. No, no. It's so the way I like to think about it, and I think if, if you know, if you have non-technical, I'll, I'll do this in a non-technical way. Um, Please. <laughs> if you so, so there's the, the, there's a term for these omnibus bills in government, right? An omnibus bill is when you yeah. bundle everything together and you pass it all at once. And you kind of have to do things like that to get things done in Washington. Hard forks are a lot like omnibus bills because you can't update the, the network live and in pieces. You have to bundle everything together. You have to coordinate with everybody and you have to bundle everything together and then you have to do it all at once. Got it. And, and, and a big part of that is because you have to take the network down. Um, and that's really what a hard fork is. It's like a restart of the network. And so you have to do all of this work to make sure that the, that it's a seamless process. And so what we did is we enabled piecemeal updates of the chain live. And we've already actually used this, um, to fix a, a bug in consensus code, um, in the token contract. And you wouldn't have even noticed that it happened. And it went through decentralized governance and everything. So we have decentralized on-chain governance. Um, and yeah, and the way we implement it is interesting. I'm sure we'll get into that detail. But like most blockchains are actually still struggling with this problem. It's not just Ethereum because most blockchains are designed exactly like Ethereum. 
Some, a a very small number, which we can talk about, have have a degree of forkless upgradability. But what you'll see when you look into how they implement it, they still have that omnibus problem where like you have to bundle everything together and it's like really hard to actually create these, these, um, these upgrades. Um, but when you do have them and you push them, they go live to the network, which is great. So like Tezos has that. Um, so that's like a huge improvement versus how Ethereum upgrades, but it's not nearly the level of upgradability that, that, that we have. Okay. Gotcha. So I wanted to kind of maybe, I do want to talk about the decentralization. I don't want to get too into the tech, at least specifically on, a, on be a this one, because <laughs> I just want to even be able to ask you questions. It'll, but uh, as far as as far as development goes, you know, developer, in my opinion, the dApps that get built on smart contract chains, the dApps they're they're really what drive the value for the underlying chain, right? Obviously. And I know I mentioned, I think I saw something that was like C++ and there's a couple languages in there, but I, I guess the question I want to ask is why would a developer choose to come and build on Coinos instead of something like ETH or any of the other smart contract chains? Yeah, that's a great question. And one thing I'll say is it's funny. You say like, obviously it's about the developers and the apps that they build. I would um, imagine. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. But the funny thing is that if you look at most blockchains out there, I would argue every single one, um, they're terrible developer experiences. They're not built for developers. Um, And we could talk about who they are built for, but they're not built for developers. And so when we were all throughout the development process, I mean, we're developers, right? We were the developers of Steemit and the Steam blockchain. So we're arguably like some of the most experienced decentralized application developers in the world. At one time, Steam was the most used blockchain in the world by like orders of magnitude. Um, Steamit.com was the most used decentralized application in the world, right? And and the reason, whole reason we started Coinos and Coinos Group was because we knew all these developers who were really struggling to build apps and we wanted to build something for them. And so I was very adamant from the beginning. Obviously, this was an easy sell to my developer co-founders that we would be developer obsessed, that every decision that we would make when building this blockchain would be about the developer first, and any other decision would have to be secondary to being developer friendly. And so when you look at Coinos, everything is about maximizing the developer experience. Like you mentioned the, the languages. So we have a feature called universal language support. A lot of the ways that chains get performance um, and scalability is by developing custom virtual machines and custom programming languages, right? So you highly constrain developers and so that you can get some performance and scalability. And and so one of the things we were like, look, we want to enable developers to program in the programming languages they already know and love. We know how hard it is to get developers to build on blockchain. If possible, we need to meet them where they're at. And we applied this in a lot of different places, right? So from the beginning, we were looking at WebAssembly as the foundation um, because it's it's a really great technology. It's operating at scale. It's all about performance and um, language support, right? Um, and and so all along the way, we're choosing Wasm for the language support. Then we're choosing Google's protocol buffers, and all of this is just to say that throughout that process, we never compromised on that. Um, picking the tools that enabled the best developer experience. And so, yes, we have C++ and TypeScript smart contracts. And TypeScript, is the TypeScript smart contracts, that's accessible to a JavaScript developer. So like right there, you've basically got all developers totally covered. But because of the underlying design, we can add support for Python, 
for C sharp, for pretty much any programming language you you can imagine. And so that's that's just one obvious example. Believe it or not, the feeless transactions, the free to use, that's very developer friendly. First of all, at a very economic level, fees wind up costing developers a lot of money. They're also one of the biggest challenges that you have to work around when you're trying to build an app that anyone would want to use, right? Yeah. So ironically, getting there were a lot of places where by getting rid of the fees entirely or getting rid of the gas fees entirely, you actually solve a lot of problems. Um, and that's really the key to delivering innovative tech. It's, it's really simplifying. Um, and, and yeah, thinking outside of the box, it's not about some magic new consensus algorithm. Okay. Well, because I, I, I'm glad I wanted to talk about a little bit because in uh, about the economics and hopefully you can maybe help me with a little bit of my perspective because I have been trapped in the ETH fee sort of paradigm where without, without an L1's coin just so happened to be called coin in this instance, uh, being used for gas fees, is there really like a necessity or a need to buy coin, coinos itself? And then I suppose, because going to the economics, like for example, I think that a lot of reason why people are stuck on Ethereum potentially, even though the fees are really high in the bull run and there's, there's issues with it, solidity is hard, I hear, and whatnot, is that they've invested in ETH and they want to see ETH value go up and there's like a natural need to buy it if you want to transact on there because it's the gas fee for the L1. So like in terms of the developers on Coinos, if the coin itself isn't used for gas, I guess I struggle with how is coin and the developers that want to build on coin, how are they to necessarily accrue value, especially if a developer themselves isn't creating a project that will have like its own coin or token. Sure. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, if you allow me, I want to go back and just answer the previous question as really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you launch truly decentralized, um, you really only have one choice as far as attracting developers, I would say. Or I think there's two parts to how we tackle it. The first is you have to deliver an amazing product. You have to deliver an experience that developers love. Developers don't, lo don't use things. Ask any technical person you know, developer, programmer, engineer. Ask them whether they use tools because somebody pays it, pays them to use it, or whether it's because they like it. They will tell you, they will use what they like. <laughs> they might use it. They, they, you can pay them to use something once, but at the end of the day, they choose their the tools based on how much they like them. So building an amazing product. Um, and then the other thing, and I, I actually tweeted about this recently because um, it's kind of a different way that I'm looking at how our product at Coinos Group and how I think the Coinos community can think about this is making every developer who chooses to build on Coinos feel like a VIP. That's what I want our company to be doing. That's what I want our product, which is a SaaS platform for Coinos. It's called Coinos Pro. The MVP is out. It's nothing to write home about. It's very MVP. Um, but that's yeah. it. That's what I think, you know, great product. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and then make developers feel like a VIP. And then we're doing some other stuff. We do have developer incentives going on. We do have a hackathon going on, but you said it yourself. It's the dApps, stupid. It's the developers, <laughs> it's the dApps, and it's not a hundred developers. It's a million developers. Yeah, it's a it million apps, yeah. you know? So like, yeah, you, you need to do stuff here and there to overcome the cold start problem. But at the end of the day, there has to be underlying value and virality Otherwise, you're not going to get to the scale that you need. Okay, that's that. No, yeah, that, yeah, because I, I mean, I know that there's some projects. Uh, I won't name them in the, you know, but they they have 
with the fee, with the gas token, they're paying like if, if a developer writes a smart contract, say, and then another project comes and just kind of pulls that smart contract and it, it executes, the developer can get paid a part of those fees because other people are using their smart contracts. I know that's one way that some projects are incentivizing development on the platform, but at the end of the day, I guess I'm kind of believe that everyone is selfish and they just want to do whatever will help get them rich. That's the benefit of Bitcoin in their model. It's like everyone is in it for their own best interest and that's what makes it secure. And so I'm just wondering, yeah, just how, I know that a, a great experience is amazing. No one wants to show up and mm -hmm. develop where it's no fun to develop. But I just wonder what incentive outside of the experience, like what financial incentive sure. does a dev have to come and build on Coinos? You know what I mean? Absolutely. And we 100% agree with you. We are obviously, you know, believe in incentives and uh, <laughs> right. yeah, that, that people respond to incentives. We're not I idealists at, at all. Yeah. Um, and, and there certainly is that incentive that you're, that you're looking for. I think an interesting place to start the conversation is that example that you gave of the protocol that says, oh, you know, we have these fees, but a percentage of it, we have this very clever mechanism for, you know, distributing part of the fee to other people to incentivize them. Guess what you can implement on a general purpose blockchain that has no fees if you want if it's truly valuable you can implement that exact same system okay <laughs> so you know like uh, so okay there's an opportunity for a developer if that is truly a good business model a developer can implement that one on but you know what you can't implement on a fee-based platform a free-to-use business model yeah that's that's true so would, yeah. the thought, would the thought that there be that someone could build a DAP that would create those incentives for possible developers? I don't know. See, this is where my tech dumminess starts to, <laughs> starts to really You show. know what? The, 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 the problem is that the, the more informed people become about the technology, you, there's, this, there's this like uncanny Dunning-Kruger valley where unless you really get the tech, you just get dumber the more you understand the tech. <laughs> I'm and I have this I am an expert on. You know, oh, yeah. like people start to learn and they just come up with the craziest, craziest crap. So actually staying high level and not getting low level. Yeah. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, ordinary people have to use this, ordinary developers. Developers are basically in the same place as people who know nothing about blockchain, right? This is another like recurring theme within our story is remembering. And I learned this because, because really what I was at Steam, at Steamit, was like the developer liaison. That's a, I realized kind of early on that what we really needed more than anything was a developer liaison. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and through, I've, you know, spent hundreds of hours talking to developers about what they need. And I realized fairly early on that developers did not want to know anything about how the blockchain worked. Um, they didn't care. And the more you ask them to know about it, the more likely you were to lose them as a customer. Um, so, okay, let's get to the incentives though, because uh, obviously hugely important. And I think the simplest way to think about this now is that you're gonna like this because of your background which we have the same background, by the way. After law school, I worked in real estate. Hey, cool. Uh, think of the Coinos model as more like a real estate model where you buy the land and you get the right to use that land forever because you own the land. The difference is that on Coinos, what you own is basically a percentage of the network's resources. Mm -hmm. And you can either use those resources yourself in perpetuity, or you can share those resources with other people. And so who we see really accumulating coin tokens are developers who want to build on Coinos, who want to give some freemium experience, freemium, right? Um, not 
entirely free forever. You got to make money sometime, but yeah. a freemium experience so that you can onboard as many users as possible, right? By sharing the network resources that you own with them. And now you can start to see how it's absolutely in your best interest. I'm a developer. I'm going to come in and add value to this protocol. How do I capture that value? Well, if on other chains like Ethereum, you are losing your ownership of the blockchain the more you use it because use it. You're, yeah, yeah. Because you're using it, because you're paying these fees. In fact, you don't own anything at all. You have the ability, you have the right to pay whatever the fee is at the moment. That's not really owning much of anything it, it, in my current viewpoint. Like when I first got involved, I think I thought I really owned a part of this network, but I think what part of what was so deeply frustrating to me um, about Bitcoin and Ethereum that drove me towards Steam was the feeling like I don't own anything. I have these tokens that I have no use for. So what am I doing now on Coinos? Even if I'm not a developer, I can share my resources with a developer. I can share my resources with my friends and family. Um, and there's all kinds of other cool thing. I mean, as you saw, you mentioned the demo, but the developer, this is a great example for anybody who wants to just see this in action because Coinos is feature complete. It's live. There's nothing missing. Uh, if you go to the Condor web wallet, there's an, he just, he just shares his mono with you. Right. So you want to do a transaction. There's a free mana option and you just click the free mana option and he he pays the mana um, for that transaction. And so it's totally free to use for you. Um, and he's not spending any tokens on his end. Some of his mana is getting consumed, but that mana regenerates over the course of five days. So and, and in all probability, it actually ge generates a lot faster. We say five days, but practically speaking, it winds up being a lot faster. Right. Which I think is such a cool feature, that whole regeneration of your life in a way. You know? <laughs> so Thank cool, you. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We love, we love it too. Yeah. Um, so I, okay. So that's, that's pretty good. I uh, want to move on to, and uh, I, t I talked about this in that video and I did a review video on this is what, uh, Andrew was referring to a couple times. I'll leave a link to that down in the description if you want to check it out. But I had covered this chart on uh, the decentralization in the block producers. And I think I might have been looking at this wrong. Can you see this, by the way? Yeah. I'm not sure because like Bitcoin, for example, you can have a miner located all over the world and they point their hash power to mining pools. And the pools are big. And those are, I think, what people think is getting centralized. Not to mention you have these big mining companies, you know, like Riot and, and whatever. Uh, is that what's happening here? Or is this, are these individual, would this be the equivalent of one person mining? Or are these pools? Because just from as an outsider, I think in the video, this is the article I pulled up. It's like these 15 entities are producing 95% of the blocks. Is this is this centralized to these 15? Am I looking at this wrong? And if it is centralized like this, what is the plan to sort of spread this out over time? Sure, yeah. Um, well, decentralized projects have no central planning, um, but am I worried? Right. <laughs> right, right. Am I, am I worried about decentralization over over time um no but let's get in but but we'll get into that to answer your question yes i think most of these are the equivalent of like mining pools uh so okay. burn coin uh that's the biggest one that's a that's a mining pool um and it's mining pool is kind of, we call them burn pools um, i was gonna say really quick just for anyone that's watching this that might be interested in buying it one feature that people like is to be able to stake or delegated proof of stake. Is that is it possible to stake? Like if I buy a thousand coin coins, can I stake those with a validator? Is that kind of similar? 
Yeah. So short answer is, yeah, you can stake your coin inside one of these burn pools and they okay. give a, they give a fixed APY. Now, the really cool thing is that burn pools are not designed into the protocol. These are applications um, that uh, give you the functionality. Uh, and I could, we, I, I won't get lost in the technical detail here, but I think it's really cool because like, so at the protocol level, it's just proof of burn. You burn tokens, you burn coin, and you get virtual hash power. And then you produce blocks, you run a node, you produce blocks, you submit blocks. Um, and then there's a, there's a verifiable random function on the chain that looks at how much VHP you have, which is how much you've burned, and, uh, and whether you produce the valid block or not. And it, it, it distributes the rewards based on whether there's valid blocks and, uh, based, and, and modified by how much you burned. So the more you burn, the more likely you are to receive a block reward. And so you wind up getting um, like a proxy of like a facsimile of proof of work, but without the expensive work. Now that's just, and it's very simple. It's like a very, very simple algorithm. Like you burn one coin, you get one virtual hash power. Um, and then as you receive rewards, um, your virtual hash power, it gets consumed. So you're like your your miner like degrades, just right, like a, right. like a proof of work miner, um, and so you kind of have to like re up your your virtual hash power. Um, now in our white paper, we did highlight the possibility of burn pools, where you create a smart contract that accepts this stuff, um, and you can like construct um, a mining pool uh, on, on top of a decentralized mining pool. Right. So um, and, and so that's what that's what those are. People people built those and Burncoin was the first. That's why it's the biggest. Um, and so uh, now the interesting thing and just to be clear, we want the person who wrote that article controls one of the biggest burn pools. He's a miner. He's a burn pool operator. In fact, he created an app called Fogata that is a, a burn pool launcher. So you could okay. go in. It makes it easy to, to spin up your own. Yeah, yeah. You could, like literally you, I know you're non-technical, but you could <laughs> go into Fagata, spin up a burn pool, and then go out to your followers and be like, if you want to support me, here's a way to support me. Tell it, put your coin into my burn pool. You get this APY and this small percentage goes to me. And it's a way for people to fund projects and people are already doing this or fund people um, and also achieve a yield. And it's an app. Um, so, but, but so, and the reason why he built that is because we all want more decentralization and this is a way to get more people um, running nodes. By the way, also spinning up your own node is totally accessible to you as well. You could participate in proof of burn mining if, if you really wanted to. Um, but and, and over time, the trend has been more decentralization. We were much more decent, we were much more centralized when we started, you know. <laughs> like at the very beginning, there were very few people producing blocks, but the tokens had already been distributed through proof of work mining on Ethereum. So there were already 3,000 addresses with tokens. So even though when we started, there were very few people producing blocks, there was still this degree of decentralization in the token, um, and that continues to be a component. Now, the last thing I want to mention here is that, uh, and I think this is actually a feature that was recently added to Fogata, there's the ability to design these burn pools so that when I give you my coin, I can specify my vote on governance upgrades. Because the question is, the question that you ultimately want to ask is, what does it mean that this person controls such a large percentage of block production? Why does it matter? What harm can they do to the network? The reason why nobody cares that Bitcoin mining is highly centralized is because there's nothing they can really do to the to Bitcoin. What are they going to do? You know, yeah. Maybe push an upgrade that I don't like. Well, what upgrade are you pushing to Bitcoin, right? And and like anyway, so now now Coinos is much more upgradable. 
um, right by design. So upgrades may will probably will play a much greater role in the evolution of the chain. Um, now imagine there's a few burn pools and but there's a hundred people participating in that burn pool and they vote on what that burn pool votes on. And I'm specifically referring to voting that is mediated via a smart contract. So yeah. it is literally those people programmatically, verifiably, decentralizedly voting on that upgrade. So that's all just to say that just looking at the block producer count, I think, misses this critical component that we can have decentralized voting through these burn pools, that people can immediately take their coin out of these burn pools if they don't like the way that the burn pools are voting. And there's a month long governance process. So there's a lot of time in here to reallocate your capital and put it somewhere where it can vote on what you want. And so that raw count there, I think, is missing the big picture. I'm actually very happy where the decentralization is now, um, as long as we're growing and becoming more and more decentralized over time. I mean, obviously, we want thousands of nodes all over the world. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I think uh, Cosmos is like that. Like you can delegate to a, a, you know, a validator and then they put in their vote for everyone in the, in their, that they're, you know, their pool. But if you actually go and do a vote, you override your stake that is delegated with them. So you can actually still just do your individual voting. It's only if you choose not to vote, then it just autos to whatever that validator. So I know it's possible. Like people do that. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff on Cosmos. Also Cardano has that kind of thing. What's really cool about how we do it um, is again, that fact that Coinos is built on a, on that very simple egalitarian accessible proof of burn mechanic where you can spin up your node today and start producing blocks. It's very, very easy. And it doesn't matter how much you burn. You can literally burn 10 coin and participate. Cool in governance, you're not likely to win a reward anytime soon right? Um, because it's such a low percentage of the virtual hash power, but you theoretically can. See, um, and that's what, and that's what you're saying. I think this just clicked for me then. So like, <laughs> I don't actually, it doesn't matter what my computer, I'm, I'm not really running a, I suppose you still have to run a node, right? Like you're still running a node, no. but I, could I do that on just like a standard Mac computer? Yeah, it, I've it usually really got one running on my my this machine that I'm using. So it's right really now. just the amount of mm -hmm. coin that I put. I interesting. I was well, you burn it. it, so you have to burn it, right? Um, right. And decrease the and it actually decreases the money supply. Um, is there is there a way to think about that as almost like staking, where you it is very burn, similar. You have a thousand coin. Just for anyone watching this, that might be confused by the proof of burn. Let's say I have a thousand coin and I burn it to produce uh, virtual hash power. That one thousand coin slowly gets released back to me over time, along with an additional reward from emissions. Correct? Yes, like it's that. very it's very similar to liquid staking. There are a few important differences, um, but you could start, it's very very analogous. Uh, in fact, I'm, yeah, like I said, I think, you know, it's kind of exactly like liquid staking. Um, <clears throat> but there are, there are several important differences, um, forcing people to actually destroy their token, right? So the coin token is the only token that comes with computational resources, right? So you get mana and you can use the blockchain <clears throat> with staking. We believe that it is fundamentally different to say, I'm moving my tokens over here and then I'm getting them back, than it is to say, I am destroying these. I'm giving up this money. You know, like say you hand me a hundred dollars and I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna give you these hundred dollars back in a month versus I, I, I say, you know, like, no, 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 no. You have to light those on fire. You know, that proves, <laughs> yeah. right? That's a. The, yeah, in math, there's a term called an absorbing barrier, right? It's like a very, it's an irreversible decision. Uh, and, and it has important consequences in how the mechanics, as far as the consensus algorithm goes, um, there's a couple of key things. 
the first is will in exchange burning customer tokens is very different thing for an exchange than staking them. So that gets back to the exchange attack problem where when you have staking, um, exchanges immediately have total control, total power over your chain. Um, cause it's really costs them nothing, um, yeah. to attack the chain with proof of burn. They're never going to do that. That's just not going to happen. They're not going to burn user funds to attack a chain. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that with, with proof of stake, you, because the tokens still exist, you need something called slashing conditions. And what that means is that you basically need a lot more complication in order to enforce rules um, about whether or not block producers are behaving correctly. Um, yeah. And that's not that big of a deal in traditional computer systems, but it's a huge deal in blockchain systems because every additional logic that you have on chain makes your chain less efficient and less performant. Makes so sense. by going, yeah. So by going with proof of burn, we don't need slashing conditions. The way we think about it is actually the best way to think about it in terms of proof of stake is that it's like proof of stake, except you're slashing up front. Um, slashing. <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Shit. No, no, no. You, so you pre-slash their whole pile and then it's yeah. like better behave if you want to get this back. I'll earn it back. Right. Absolutely. And then we define behaving as whatever people do to produce blocks and get their, and get, get right, their right. stash back, you know? Um, so yeah, sorry. That's proof of burn. Yeah. We're, and it's kind of like proof of burn is a really interesting, like slow burn. Like when you first look, like when we first started thinking about it, we're like, okay, it's like proof of stake and maybe it's a little bit different, but like over years, because we basically designed proof of burn last because of the upgradability of Coinos. That's the beauty of like that design is like, you can really wait a long time to design certain things. Cause like we didn't touch on this, but what enables these capabilities is that everything is done in smart contracts, even, even the system logic. So when, you know, when we talk about proof of burn, there's a proof of burn smart contract. It's, it's a special, it's called a system smart contract, but it's a smart contract. Um, <clears throat> there is a decentralized governance smart contract, right? There's, there's none of this code that I talk about exists as this separate thing from smart contracts. There are system smart contracts and there's user smart contracts. So <clears throat> anyway, um, I forget the point that I was trying to make. <laughs> no, you're good. We can just keep it moving. I think we're covering a lot here. We're at 50, 53 and a half minutes. So I, I want to wrap it up with with this question, which is ba basically uh, essentially just word for word what you shared in your comment on my video there. But so what are what do you see are the biggest challenges that you guys are going to be facing? It doesn't even have to it doesn't have to be technical. It could be literally anything. What are the biggest challenges you guys are facing and how do you plan to overcome them? Yeah, I actually don't think the challenges are technical. I think Koinos is pretty darn amazing. Um, ultimately, scaling solutions will have to be implemented. That's just the reality of building stuff. That's why we made Koinos so upgradable, um, right? The work never stops. The question is just how easy and accessible is it to get the work done? And, and, and how capital efficient um, is it? I think that's something that people dramatically underestimate. It, it, the problem of scaling is not the problem. Capital efficiency is the problem. You've got a limited amount of capital and you have to deploy that to solve, you know, the most important problems in the right order as quickly as you can. And so upgradability is really like a capital efficiency solution where it makes it much more capital efficient to solve problems. Um, new chain, separate chain, not connected to anything. Uh, I think you touched on that in your video. That's been a, a large hurdle to get to, to get past. You got to get people to build on something totally new, totally different um, on its own little island. <clears throat> um, yeah. I mean, do you guys have yeah. a, I can't remember. Do you guys have a bridge out to 
or or any plans to maybe bridge to Ethereum or Binance or or any of the other chains? Um, we don't have any bridges in operation now. Um, I never talk publicly about any plans that we have for future partnerships or developments uh, yeah. until they're ready to go, right about to happen. So um, what I would say about bridges is that I think, and I know many of the people in the community think that uh, we need to get connected to other ecosystems. Um, you know, our, I'm ashamed that I've gotten through this whole conversation without saying our mission, which is to accelerate decentralization through accessibility, right? So the way I see bridges is that it's an accessibility solution. Uh, making Coinos accessi accessible to more developers, to um, more speculators, right? All the people who are critical for um, uh, a platform like this to, to thrive. I'm actually really excited. Um, a Coinos Federation was announced today. Now, this is kind of breaking news for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, a Coinos Federation. So I, I recommend you check out that announcement. It, it, uh, the guy behind it is a guy named John Rice. Um, this is has nothing to do with us, but John Rice was the former editor in chief of Coin Telegraph for years. He was the editor in chief of Coin Telegraph. Um, he was more recently the editor in chief of Blockworks. So he's a really serious person, uh, and he's been kind of an informal advisor to me and the project for a long time. Um, He's a great person and he's decided to fresh out of Blockworks to jump in, get his hands dirty and start a Coinos Federation, which is very different than a foundation. I think it's really interesting that he chose the Federation model. Um, but yeah, that's really exciting news. Uh, the way I see what he's doing is add, adding this. Well, I mean, this is what he's explained to me. It's like a coordination layer. Right. Because when you have a really decentralized ecosystem, like people like this is getting back to that block producer thing, that block producer. Um, yeah, sure. yeah. To me, it, it really doesn't tell the whole story. And I think it's funny because like I kind of had this disagreement with Julian, the guy who wrote that article, who's a block producer and an amazing engineer. And he's contributed to Coinos. He does not work for Coinos Group. He's great. I love him. He's amazing. Um but decentralization is about so much more than just block producer count in the moment. It's about everything. It's about how you launch. It's about how things are maintained at the time. It's about who has all the money and who has all the power. And we have very little money and no power, you know, <laughs> and we're Coinos group and we created this thing. And it's like, isn't that what matters? Like you're focusing on the small number. It's like, what matters is, are things going up? Up? Are the number of people running nodes going up? Are the number of DApps going up? Um, and I think the critical thing there is coordination. Without us, I think the, the going back to the challenges and the valid criticisms. Like the most valid criticism of us is that because we didn't ICO and we don't have all of this money and we're not doing everything, it's a disorganized mess. Mm. Um, and, um, now we would take a disorganized, decentralized mess over a centralized, you know, piece of crap lie, um, any day of the week. Um, but, uh, yeah, we need that, but, but that's, what's so exciting about this Coinos Federation is because John has the experience. He's a leader. He has leadership experience, management experience, and I know that he's going to come in and he's going to help all of us crazy people building on Coinos work together, pool our resources, figure out how to market together and move as a unified force so that we can cut through the noise, which is the other major challenge that I would cite is that there's so much noise. I'm not afraid of the competition at all. Um, in fact, I, as long as people are trying to accelerate decentralization through accessibility, I support those projects. But the noise, the terrible deafening noise, drowning everything out, that is a challenge to, to cut through. But, you know, got to get a, plans. 
you got to get a, a Pepe built on top of Coinos, and maybe they'll be. Yeah. <laughs> People are working on it. <laughs> There's a Dogecoin with a K. There's a Bit Bitcoin oh, with a K. Oh, there you go. All oh yeah. People oh, are man. way ahead of you. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about it, but as long as yeah. they're building, uh, you know, as long as they're a developer on Coinos, I'm gonna treat them like a VIP. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a fan of the meme coins either. It's just they tend they get attention, and it is what it is. You know what I mean? Like, I can't fight what people are interested in. Absolutely. But, uh, Whatever gets people to take ownership of their digital lives through blockchain adoption, that's what we're all about. Got to connect to other ecosystems, got to partner up with other projects, get great games on board, get great apps on board. We have a term, do all the things. We got to do all the things, build a great product. Um, you know, I, I haven't talked much about our product because we're not really marketing it at the, at the moment. It's, it's very raw state, but um uh, Coinos Pro is a SaaS platform and it, you know, developer tooling, it's, it's a big deal for, for, for building on, on blockchains. And so that's really how we're focusing our energy is we, we don't want to be competing with developers. We, we built Coinos to empower developers. So Coinos Pro is really us asking the question, what else do developers need to make it even more fun? and faster and easier to build amazing Coinos apps and monetize them, monetize them. Um, you know, yeah. Yeah. You yeah, in fact, yeah. That w we think that's absolutely key. We, you know, we think that really the killer app of web three is monetizing open source software. I feel like we've kind of gone in a nice full, full circle there. Uh, yeah. from, from the origins and, you know, it, it, I, I, this is uh, why I'm so excited about where we're at now and what we're doing at Coinos Group, because building a blockchain is fun. It's insanely hard and challenging work. Um, but, you know, once that done, well, that, once that was done, it was kind of like an existential crisis where it's like, now what? Um, and once the, you know. Um, everybody else like goes to some private island, but we very intentionally okay. set things up so that we couldn't buy our own island. We like actually have to figure out how to add value there. Um, and, and the plan was always a SaaS platform, um, but it's just a very different mindset to be like, we're building the best blockchain. Now, how do we build the best SaaS platform? And to come full circle and after talking, talking it over with the guys dozens and dozens of times and realizing, you know, it's you still can't make money off of open source software. Um, and that's not what other blockchains are trying to do. And it's not what other blockchains are good at because the way you monetize open source software is through network effects. And the way that you get network effects is through freemium business models. Um, and so you like, yes, Tokenization is important, digital assets, even ICOs have a place. But if you can't enable a developer to have a freemium uh, tier of their application, they're not going to be able to get the kind of growth that they need to really turn that passion project into a livelihood. And so that's really, that's what we're all about is how do we empower open source software developers to turn their passion projects into their livelihoods. Yeah. I mean, hell, that's a pretty good mission statement right there as well. Yeah. I, yeah well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you think so. You know, I think a lot of people are gonna kind of dismiss that and say stuff like, well, if, it, if you're thinking about, you know, what about the users? Well, what about VCs? Well, what about speculators? But to your point, it's all about the dApps, right? The best thing for speculators, the best thing for investors, um, the best thing for users is a great platform for developers because they're going to build those apps. It's all about the apps, right? Yeah. So I, you were spot on from the beginning. I didn't want you to make, you know, my, oh, I don't want my response to... <laughs> oh, yeah, you're it just good. seems like nobody else thinks that. Like you look at these other protocols and they're like, well, it's great for developers because it's scalable. It's like, that doesn't make sense. That's not a, that's not like, that's not what makes something good for developers. That's what developers expect. Right. 
Yeah, it's supposed, <laughs> it, it's supposed to be able to reach the users. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Well, is there well is there anything in like at, towards the end here that we didn't talk about that you wanted to share? Oh my. Um, no, I'd like to just end on highlighting how many great applications are coming online now and that people should check them out. Um, there's, there's coin DX, which is a DEX on Coinos. Um, and, and, uh, w with, without gas fees. Oh, right. Yeah. There, this is a good, great list. Um, yeah, there's, there's, people, I mean, there's dApps being built. It looks like oh, yeah, developers love Coinos. This is, I have zero fear about this. When, when, when developers learn about Coinos, they love building on it because it's easy. One of the developers, an app that I want to tell you that I was just going to mention, it's called Canvas with a K. Everything's with a K on Coinos. Yeah. <laughs> this is not a rule. This happened totally organically, which I love. Um, but Canvas, it's a pixel painting app where if you hold their token, um, if you go to, yeah, Canvas, Canvas Dash app, yeah, if you click on that, actually. Um, right, so each one of these pixels is represents a transaction. Oh, all right, you're going to have to click into the app if you scroll down. Uh, scroll down, scroll down. It's kind of hidden, actually. Um, you just seen it right there at the top. Enter the app. Wait, no, actually go up. You must have scrolled right. It, it, it is near the top, but it's... Oh, and play the game. You're right by it. Buy some can oh, and play the game. This might play video. We'll see. No, no. It's this. But yeah, is, so. so so each one of these pixels is a transaction, but nobody spent any tokens. Right? So if you hold K-A-N, you can paint pixels. Um, so we're talking thousands and thousands of transactions and no tokens spent. Um Right, so fun applications like this um, are coming online all the time. Oh, there was something specific about Canvas that I wanted to tell you. Um, well, did, did you ask a question that led me into this? No, just just what um, what what do you want to end with? And then we started. We we've been talking about DApps. So I had pulled up. You said a great. Uh, oh a great experience for developers. And then you've got dApps being right. built and I just happened to pull it up and totally distract you. <laughs> no, 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 no. That was perfect. So like you, you pulled up the perfect thing. Coiner.app is a great place to see all the dApps. Um, Canvas. Well, there's an interesting backstory real quick. Yeah. So the developer behind this before this, because he wanted, he had this vision of Canvas in his mind for years he built his own Cosmos-based chain in order to make this vision a reality because he wanted to get rid of fees. And I guarantee you, you're going to see more and more developers coming out and saying this with respect to Coinos. They're going to say, um, I was always looking for a blockchain with no fees. I spun up my own Cosmos chain. I thought about building my own parachain, blah, blah, blah. Um, we saw this happen with Steam. They would always fork Steam because they wanted fearless transactions. Um, <clears throat> went through all the work of building his own Cosmos blockchain. Was like, I don't want to launch this thing. I don't want to run this thing. I don't want to deal with that mess and just gave up on it, right? Um, then we launched our hackathon starting a month ago, which is still going on. So if there are any developers who, there's still two weeks left. So if there are any developers who want a chance to win some coin, they can participate in the hackathon. It's, it is totally possible to spin up a block, uh, uh, a Coinos based application in a couple of days. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, he abandoned that, that blockchain cause who wants to build their own blockchain? It's a nightmare. Um, so you can build blockchains, you can build custom blockchains on Coinos. It's actually an amazing blockchain framework. You just don't need to at this point. You're much better off launching on the mainnet. Um, and buy some coin because he's like, hey, I know there's value in a free to use blockchain and a feeless blockchain. We launched the hackathon. He spins up uh, this app uh, and makes his dream into a reality. And I think he's a strong contender for winning because I think it's a great app. But I think that's an interesting story because, you know, it shows 
I there's a, there's a lot that I like about the Cosmos ecosystem, but it certainly highlights a critical difference um, between the two projects and the value that Coinos can provide to some developers that they aren't going to get from something like Cosmos or or even Polkadot because these are hub and spoke models where the bit where the core chain is not does not have smart contracts. So you either have to find another chain or spin up your own chain. And that's yeah. a core difference. So we can actually spin out different chains on top of the Coinos blockchain framework. But right now we don't have to. We have this great high performance, highly scalable, highly upgradable mainnet. So um, and the possibility to have custom sister chains at some point in the future. Uh, so it's a it's a fundamentally different approach. Um, to what Polkadot and, and Cosmos did. It's almost like a hybrid between Solana and, and Polkadot and, um, and Cosmos. Interesting. Okay. Well, but decentralized, obviously. Right, right. <laughs> well, uh, I think this is a good place to end it. If people want to find mm -hmm. you, I'll have a link to your Twitter for sure. Is there anywhere else where you might want people to find you? Oh, no, my Twitter's good, Andrarchy. Um, check out, you know, the Coinos Network on Twitter. It's a Coinos Network on Twitter, coinos.io. I mean, at this stage, I'm pretty much still just evangelizing for Coinos because the way we see it is that the best way to get people building on Coinos Pro is to get them building on Coinos. That's kind of the beauty of how we set things up is that what benefits Coinos benefits us because we're going to we're providing the most trustworthy, performant, scalable API endpoint. And that's really what developers want to interact with when they're building applications on a blockchain. They don't want to deal directly with the blockchain. They just want to deal with API calls and have somebody else manage and run the infrastructure for them. So who better than the team that in invented the blockchain, right? <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, coinos.io to learn more about Coinos. And yeah, that's enough. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks again, Andrew, for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You know, very few crypto YouTubers actually reach out to us and want to chat uh, unless it's asking for money. So it's always nice when, when somebody is just interested in what we're doing. So I appreciate 100%. it a lot. Awesome, man. I'll, uh, maybe we'll have to do another one in the future. Whenever you want. I'm All here. Right, cool. All right.